Hi everyone and welcome to Make It Happen TV. You have no idea how excited I am today because I've got from my favourite football club a legend, Mr Mikhail Sylvester joining us today. Hi mate, how are you? Hi, how are you? Jolly good, thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a million questions, okay. Okay, I'm going to let our audience learn all about you. Okay, first of all, I think everyone needs to see a little bit of your highlights, the kind of stuff that you've done, the success you've had at mainly Manchester United, but I know that you were at a club, I can't remember, from London somewhere once before as well. I think it was Arsenal. Take a look at this clip and we'll join Michael in a second. And here's Silvestre in acres of space, and he scored! Mikel Silvestre! And there's another header, and it's another goal for Mikel Silvestre! Okay, so I know that you probably have been interviewed a thousand times about football over the years, and the probably if I was to guess what was Probably the question you're asked the most is, who was the best person to work for? Was it uh, Alex Ferguson or was it uh, uh, Arsene Wenger? Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a question I got a lot, a lot of, a lot of times. Do you still like talking about football in today's day and age? I mean, you're retired now, you're a businessman and stuff. Is it something you're still interested in talking about or kind of like, is that your past? Um, yeah, I'm always interested. I'm watching more football than I used to when I was playing uh, because I like to, uh, to analyze the game, uh, the coaching, the decision, uh, and the business also behind, uh, behind the scene and the consequences on the pitch as well. So I try to look at, at both. And when you were younger and you were in the game, did you look at it completely differently to how you do now? Did you never ever think about the commercial aspect and the business aspect of football as a player? No, definitely. I was just a consumer. Uh, I was part of it. I was an employee. I had contracts, but I was just looking at my career, looking maybe uh, at the next oppo opposing to the uh, next opponent. Uh, we look at competitions overall, but I wasn't as looking at details as I'm looking now. So let's tell the story. You leave football after all of these years of fantastic success. You must have had um, a great feeling of what you achieved over the years and how well you'd done. I mean, internationally, as long with playing for the biggest football clubs in the world. What kind of emotions does someone who has had that much kind of success and that much adoration, what kind of emotions do you go through when your career ends? Is it something like falling off a cliff or is it almost like, you know, it kind of winds down slowly before, and you start then thinking about the future slowly? How does it work? I think first of all, you have to look at uh, what football means to me uh, growing up. Uh, my cousin played also for a French national team. He's had four, uh, 13 caps, more than 500 games in the French league. Um, and my dad also played football, or my cousin, my family. So football was just natural for me. And it was about pleasure. My dad never said, you're going to be a football player, um, a professional. And I never set any target about being a professional myself. So it just came along. And all I was interested in is uh, testing myself and, uh, and reach the highest level possible. So I was uh, fortunate, but I worked hard to reach that level, um, especially with United and then French national team. Great moments, winning trophies, fantastic. So a lot of highs in my career, some lows with the injuries and sometimes where you're sitting on the bench. But overall, when uh, you see the end arriving, um, you don't know how to deal with it. Even if you try to be prepared, um, really the tough one is 
the day you're going to wake up and not going to training. And you're like, whoa, that's going to be a long day. <laughs> what I'm going to do now? <laughs> it's, yeah. really, it's really tough. So really you, tough. I suppose you're part of this kind of gang, aren't you? This, this group of, the, of men. Yeah, you're part, you're part of a team. You're always uh, part of a group. So you're part of a project. You're part of a plan. And suddenly you're on your own. You're on your own, uh, you lose a banter, you lose a planning, you lose uh, all this atmosphere where you are part of a team. So I think for me that's the hardest, be on your own. It's not necessarily be at home because you can do this and that, but it's being by yourself. You have your family, but your wife go to work, the kids go to, go to school, and you're by yourself. Uh, and you, you talk to yourself and that's, that's all you can do. And what do, do the clubs that help you prepare for that kind of stuff? Do, 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 do they have you know, other players that are one or two or three years ahead of you that have been on that journey? Do they help you prepare and understand what's going to happen? Or is it really like you say, it's kind of like you wake up and it's like, no, that's you, it? There's none of the club I've been, I've been playing for and I think I've been to different places, different continents, different leagues. And no, there's no club that prepare uh, the, the players to, to retire uh, because you don't know how many will actually from your squad will retire at the end of the season. So it's not something that clubs are, um, are trying to, to help the players with. Now, now men are notoriously bad at keeping in touch, unlike women that seem to be able to do that very easily. Was it the same for you? You, you leave football and the, you know, because that, that team, you're, you're friends I'm sure in that, that group as well. Do you, do you lose touch with a lot of them very quickly? Yeah, you lose touch, um, I wouldn't say with everybody. Um, I'm fortunate to come to an era where uh, we've got this Legends game, so we meet each other uh, at least once a year. Uh, so we keep in touch, and now with all the social media and connectivity, you can be in touch with your um, ex-teammates, uh, the one you want to, <laughs> and even, uh, <laughs> even the one you don't want to, <laughs> you have to. <laughs> That's interesting you say that. now. So you stay in touch with some people, fair enough. When you, when you woke up that morning and you realised you were no longer a professional footballer, you were now a retired professional footballer, what was the first thing you did? I didn't have that, I didn't have such a long period where um, I had nothing to do uh, because I had side projects. So I kept myself occupied with these. Uh, but then straight away I jumped into uh, a, a new position, uh, a different career as a, as a sporting director in, in France. And um, so I had maybe a four months gap um, where I wasn't uh, in a position, actually going to work, be part of a project, be part of a, of a team. So um, I was lucky um, and uh, I got myself ready into, into the job. Uh, by myself as much as I could uh, because I was living in the States so that was uh, in 2015 I was taking the job in July um, I did some research on, uh, on the club even if I knew the club because that's where I started in, in France back in uh, 93 um, I made some research and tried to uh, try to to see where, where the club was at and what could be uh, the project and uh, the, the things I would like to, to work on. What makes you qualified to go from the position you were in to becoming a sporting director in a football club? Um, Is it just, do they, they say, right, you've got lots of experience, you've done very well, um, we, we know you, we think you'd fit the job. Did you think, oh, I'm qualified for that? Or did you think, <laughs> Oh, hold on a minute, this is, this is bigger than me right now. It is, uh, that's exactly what I felt. I thought, okay, I've got the uh, background, uh, I've got some history with the club, so uh, in terms of uh, legitimity, uh, mm -hmm. it, would, yeah. Yeah, it would be okay. Um, in terms of uh, experience, okay, but in terms of, I mean, experience of the game, but experience of the role, zero. So I was a bit um, nervous, you know, so as soon as I, uh, made my first speech in front of all the employees when I got introduced by the president. I said, look guys, uh, I've done my career, I've done well for myself, but now I'm going to need you <laughs> to help me. Uh, because I was supposed to work with each, um, each parties of the, of the club, each uh, uh, sectors, uh, the pros, the academy, the administration, also the media, the lawyers and, and all this. So I said, I'm going to need you. 
And so did anyone in there take you under their wing and say, right, come on, I, I, I'm going to teach you this? Or did you say to yourself, I, I, I'm not qualified to do this. I need to go and further, further my studies. And it's an unusual thing for a lot of people to do at a retirement age. But was that something that you thought, this is what I'm going to have to do? Well, the, the president, uh, as soon as I accepted, he said, OK, fine, but you're going to be uh, needed some, uh, needing some, uh, uh, some learning. Uh, about especially accounting, uh, proper administration, the boring stuff. <laughs> and I say, fine, <laughs> okay. But then I, I, I went back to him and I said, look, there's a good, um, um, a, good, uh, a good master, a master's in sports management uh, out of the uh, University of Limoges in the middle of France. Zidane followed it, um, Laurent Blanc. Uh, so even if they they wanted to be co coaches, like managers. This is the business side of the business. So I said, this is a two-year course. Uh, let me do it while I'm in, uh, in my position. It's only once a month. You have to be away for, for a week. So that's how I felt, uh, I felt good. <laughs> and, and the confidence started growing. When you first started that course, were you thinking, Maybe the first two weeks in, were you thinking, well, hold on a minute, there's a whole lot here that I didn't really know about and uh, I wasn't expecting this? Or was it something that you kind of embraced and said, you know, this is a whole new world, I'm just going to take it all in? No, the fact that uh, it was a small class of 18 expert athletes, all, uh, all of us were in the same position and the first day you have the ones who've been there before, they come in and they testify. Uh, and for me, the, the biggest hurdle would be uh, the writing. Uh, because as, as soon as you stop uh, school, you, all you do is writing bullet points and suddenly you have to write <laughs> paragraphs and paragraphs. So that was my, my worry. Uh, but yeah, after, you know, the baccalaureate, it was a, a social and science uh, um, baccalaureate. I, I did a little bit of English course. My English is okay now. Um, I've learned Italian, but yeah, it was I mean, going back to school, uh, and, uh, like 20, 18 years later, so it was, uh, it wasn't easy. Yeah, it must be tough because <laughs> anybody going to school after that many years, it's challenging. It's isn't it? challenging. It's challenging to um, to focus for an hour and a half uh, because most of the course were an hour and a half, two hours. So sometimes you had <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> Some of us you would uh, fall a little bit on the chair. <laughs> and how much of it was practical and how much of it was classroom? Was it all just classroom or was there practical things for you to do too? It was, uh, I would say, 80% was classroom. 80%? Yeah. So it was properly going back to school, yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, properly going back to school, yeah. Yeah, I, find, I mean, I, 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 I came here 12 years ago to Dubai and I, and I wanted to learn Arabic. Mm. And, uh, you know, what was I when I came here 12 years ago? 37, or 35 when I came here. and. That, even then, at 35, that was really hard to start learning Arabic and going back and sitting in a classroom, yeah. focusing on syllabuses and, and, you know, and the books and stuff, and concentrating. I mean, I don't know what happens to us as we get older. Our attention span seems to kind of uh, wane a little bit. So that focus is really hard to, you know, to get into place. Was it it is, it is hard to, to, to stick to the, your chair because uh, you've been playing, uh, you move all the time. Right, and now you have to, suddenly you have to stay at your table and, and sit and listen quietly. <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> so after that, so then you've taken that course. You you you, you pass the course. You feel empowered. You've got the knowledge, and so you've learned something new. And obviously, you must feel good about getting through that. Was lots of what you learned very practical in terms of how you could then apply those skills, or was lots of it maybe not as valuable as as, as some of the tools that you really did need? There was, um, there was a lot of good stuff in there, um, really. Um, after, when, when you finish, you're like, I'm ready for any type of role, not only uh, in football, not only in one club, it could be a federation, it could be a league, it could be any other organization. Uh, but then there was also some repetition. I think um, I would say 60% of the course was uh, related on, on football. And with the experience, uh, you know, a lot of stuff I knew about it. But still, there was some uh, specification about uh, the French law uh, that I needed to, to learn. And uh, overall, I'm really happy I've, I've done it. Hmm. How long ago was that? Two years. Two years ago? Yeah, two years ago. 
So you finished? Well, I, mean, I, I finished. I finished in September. I graduated. I graduated in, in just September. Just last September. This, yeah. What last month or yeah. last year? Yeah, last month. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you've you passed that and you've got your graduation. You're over here in Dubai. What on earth prompted you to come to Dubai? Um, it's not any any type of position. It's a um, it's a choice of life for the family. Um, it's difficult, but I was like, okay, I'm 38, 39, or 40. Uh, what I want to be uh, achieving, or when I when I look back at 50 or 55 or 60 year old, I want to look back into those years and and make sure I've I've done the most to enjoy uh, the family life, uh, uh, being there for the kids and and uh, live in an environment where I can enjoy myself. So do a lot of sports, I enjoy the sun, the outdoor. I mean, we've been living in Oregon, so that was fantastic for two years. There was the uh, winter part. Uh, we are a big fan of, uh, but uh, we can fly to Lebanon and, and okay. ski there with our friends or some other places. I think Dubai is a, is a good place to live and, 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 and for the kids to, to grow up, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. So what do you do here? You've been you've been at a sporting director's type role. You've gone and studied. You then come here, and and when I look at lots of professional footballers, it's almost like they fall, they fall off a cliff in terms of their career. Maybe they cope with it different psychologically and emotionally, but lots of them it seems to be they they disappear into the wilderness. But some become quite entrepreneurial. They realise that they've probably earned a lot of money in a short period of time compared to probably other people having it spread out over forty years. Do, do, do most people make good use of their, their money? Have they saved their money and plan with it? Did you think about that a long time ahead of it? Or did you get to the end and say, I need to be a bit careful here now? Was it, when, when was it that you realized that you had to be sensible about what, what you were earning and how you were using that? I think straight away from, uh, from my first big earnings, um, because my parents also were looking after their small budget, I think. I started looking at my budget, and uh, straight away when I was when I played in Rennes, I wasn't yet a professional, but um, I was earning a, a decent uh, decent wage as a, an academy, an apprentice. Uh, so I bought some maybe an office in a office building uh, in in Rennes, and from now on, uh, that was what I was doing. But uh, like you said, a lot of players, um, the statistic is uh, horrendous. Uh, you know, 80% of us within five years after the end of the career end up with nothing. So that's very scary. And 80%? Yeah, uh, mainly due uh, to uh, bad investment, divorce. Um, so uh, you have players now are earning a lot of money but it's only the top clubs and then the rest they struggle because it's it's not that much money and on top of that you have the problems that comes earlier uh, than everybody because um, soon in your career you're still young you're 25 30 years you, you go into investment you go through fame and you have to deal with it and a lot of players are struggling yeah when you think about your wife and you know, you've had four kids, so that's a that's a, a full time job for a wife plus one mm. plus two plus yeah, three. Yeah, plus you know. me going everywhere. Like yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, your wife's got some entrepreneurial flair uh, with the businesses that she's recently set up. What kind of influence has your wife had over you in terms of moving forward in the right direction after leaving football? Well, she is. Uh, she has a strong character. So she's always pushing. I, I'm quite laid back. You know, I'm from the Caribbean. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to spring that, uh, spread the stereotype, but still, <laughs> I think we are pretty laid back in the Caribbean. And uh, she goes and uh, she says to me, now you have to take every opportunity uh, and network with people and engage and, and share your experience. So I'm going into a different direction at the moment. I love the media work uh, because, again, uh, it brings me back to the game and, and analyzing the game and also the business part of it because we're talking so much about the business and how big the football uh, business is growing, especially in the region with uh, PSG being owned by uh, Abu Dhabi mm -hmm. um, uh, family. Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, sorry, 
Man, Man City, City and, 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 and PSG is Doha, isn't PSG, it? No, yeah. PSG Doha. Uh, so uh, it's interesting for me to do the media. It's interesting for me maybe to start uh, an academy uh, in Dubai. And yeah, meeting a lot of people is, I mean, Dubai for, for networking is fantastic. There's lots of kids here. There's lots of academies also. Yes. Okay, it seems to have kind of, I mean, I've been here 12 years and it seems to have cropped up in the last seven or eight years, these academies from La Liga through to different uh, football clubs. How competitive is that market? Or are there enough kids to satisfy everybody? There is, I think there is enough, um, enough kids, but well, that's what I've been told. So <laughs> well, we learn quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there is a demand. Uh, I think sports is, is important for youth and you see now with the initiative of the Crown Prince mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a one month from uh, starting October 20, uh, pushing people to do 30 minutes of fitness every day. Mm -hmm. There is a real, um, the real desire, uh, and it's not for fame, it's not for uh, attracting uh, bus other businesses in Dubai. There is enough businesses. It's really to bring sport uh, into people's life because it makes a big difference. You have a personal trainer. I train myself. A fresh, uh, fresh body brings you a fresh, fresh mind. Absolutely. So you've got this, this, this idea of setting up this academy and this academy then is going to trade on the back of the success of you and your name and people are going to want, our kids are going to want to come and train because of you, the, the soccer star, which is, which is fantastic. Is there enough money in that type of business f to satisfy an ex-professional footballer? Is that type of thing, uh, is that a, a labour of love more than it is a professional career? Uh, the aim is not really to, uh, uh, you don't want to lose money for sure. <laughs> but, it's a good um, start. Yeah, Most people do. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it's a good start. You're right. But uh, we will see because I, I'd rather have uh, quality than, than quantity. Uh, it's also because uh, I'm, I might be running at, uh, on a limit, limited space. So I won't be able to, uh, to bring a lot of kids like uh, a La Liga, for example. Uh, but my idea is to really to, um, to have a synergy in connection with the local clubs, you know. Um, I think it's important if you are, with what I can bring to the table, I don't want to do uh, Mika Silvestre uh, Football Academy and that's it, just looking at myself. So I've been visiting some clubs already, I've been connecting with the Dubai Sports Council mm -hmm. and we will try to find a way where we can have a workshop and where the academy uh, from Al Nasser, from Al Ali, from all the clubs Alain, from the UE can, can come and we will share. We will share the, the knowledge and all the participants will, uh, will have access to hopefully the, the best of the best. So that sounds quite promising. Let's just have a talk about these other businesses that you're involved with because your wife clearly has got some form of entrepreneur. Uh, maybe I should interview your wife. <laughs> maybe she, <laughs> you maybe should. She, get, 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 she should come in and have a chat with us. But tell, tell us about there's a business you've got called Life that's been set up how long ago? Two months ago. So it's really new? It's really new. Yeah. Okay, so what is it? So um, it's on the back of uh, our life. Uh, I mean, it's, we're still young, but we've been uh, traveling a lot. Uh, we've been living in different continents. So France, Italy, England, Germany, uh, Portland, USA. We lived in India as well. And besides living, we've been traveling. We, we love traveling with the, with the family. So we have a lot of connections. And um, now we want to uh, just um, share the connections, uh, share the businesses and the people we've met on a professional basis. Um, so it's consulting, it's lifestyle management for people and for corporate as well. Okay. So that's the idea. And that business being set up two months ago is going to be run by your wife solely? Are you involved in the day-to-day -day running yourself? So my wife will be uh, the managing director and mm -hmm. I will be involved uh, in the uh, division for athletes, pro athletes, mainly football players, mm -hmm. you know, if I can help them. Uh, going back to, to that statistics about uh, keeping your wealth after you retire. So I, can, I could manage some players, they carry and help them to to keep going after they carry and not, not fall down. 
So you're going to focus on that. Your wife focuses on this other, on this other aspect of the business. After being a mum for as many years as she, well, she's still a mum anyway. After being focused as a mum, is it really exciting for her to get back into work again? And have you seen her kind of like highly motivated and enjoying the fact that she's getting stuck into something new? Yeah, she can't wait to to get started. You know, she's excited. She always wants to to meet people and and start uh, and start doing things. Um, and, and find solution for people, uh, try to connect one, uh, one another. And uh, yeah, she, she's very excited about it. Also, you've got another project, which is the, the rum project, which is St. Bart's? Yeah. Okay, so tell me how that came about. Well, this is, uh, that was a side project when I was playing. And um, so I was playing for Arsenal and uh, the idea came, uh, came out of uh, a discussion with some friends and reflecting on, uh, what could I do after I play football? Uh, so my roots uh, bring me back to half wave, half in France and half in the, in the archive. And, and um, I became a, a rum aficionado. Uh, I'm not drinking a lot, but I, lo I love it. I love the flavors and I like to, to discover things um, in the rum uh, environment. And the idea came out to, um, to start a, a brand uh, a luxury brand uh, of rum, because uh, in the uh, public eyes, especially in France, rum and also in America, rum is 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 the industry of uh, slavery. You know the association. Ah, okay. is, is, so that's why it's not highly pushed and and looked like champagne is very classy and stuff. So the rum is always it's been a product where you look at the at the bottom of the shelves. You know. Uh, got you. Uh, so the idea was like, okay, if uh, a vodka, uh, not to name it uh, Grey Goose, can have <laughs> the French flag and become a luxury yeah. product when it's only uh, a product that comes out of the potatoes, yeah, I'm sure that rum, uh, <laughs> the, the way the way it's it's done and 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 distilled and uh, and the history behind it, I'm sure we can we can try to to make it a luxury product. Well, if you take an example, I suppose George Clooney had that tequila brand, didn't he? That yes. he sold recently. Only, I know he had part only for a billion, yeah. Only for a billion, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't know what the journey was, but again, I think many years ago, maybe, maybe we're both exposed to this because we're not too dissimilar in age. I remember tequila as being something that you did as a shot yeah. and, and nothing more. And so I never saw that as a high class product, uh, but he went about smart marketing to create, obviously, a high class product, and they sold that for a great sum of money. When you see that story, does it excite you and motivate you to think of the possibilities with the rum brand? Yeah, definitely. When you look at Grey Goose story, you look also at Patron stories. Uh, the guy was, was broke, uh, mm -hmm. living in the street. Uh, and was then, it? And then for 10 years, he was giving bottles away. So it takes, we say to establish a, a spirit, it takes 10 years. So we have with that, it's been five years, uh, still working on it. But yeah, it, it is exciting. and. It's something that I like. I do it by passion. So when I go into events or, or, or fair or conference, it's easy for me to, to talk about it. It's natural. So, it's natural. It's like football. Yeah. It's kind of like you, you're unusual, though, aren't you? Would you would you would you agree with me on this, or are you going to sit down and be very you know very modest about it? Are you are you, are you an unusual ex-retired footballer? I don't know. You meet them. I don't know. Well, the one, the one, the, but you, when you say eighty percent, I knew the percentage was high. To the, I didn't know it was eighty percent. When when I meet and talk to them, I find that there's there's this yearning to want to feel part of something, and invariably they make bad decisions because they're trying, they're, they're trying to be part of something some way, somehow. Um, I'm staggered about how they can all end up broke because invariably a lot of them don't make their own investment decisions, they have managers. And they're, they're, they're leaning on their managers or management team for advice. And so what does that say? That, that, worries, yeah. that worries me a lot. Yeah, yeah, who are definitely. they listening to? Mm -hmm. And, and the, if 80%, then most people are listening to people that don't know what they're doing. If you had a group of 21 year old academy footballers from any of the clubs that you've played for before and you had the opportunity to sit down with them and spend an hour with them giving them some tips of what not to do what kind of you give them three tips what three tips would you give them like really important based upon based upon what happens after their career don't get married <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. I hope your wife doesn't watch this. Okay. No, I would say um, 
uh, try to, to, to select your entourage. Um, try to look ahead in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. Who's going to be there? Who can you, can you name four or five person besides your family who will be there in 20, 30 years? Can you name them? Yeah, very good point. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult when you are 18, 20 years old, you say 21, huh? mm -hmm. to identify these people. And um, it's, it's difficult. It's mm -hmm. difficult. That's why you need guidance and you need to be lucky as well. I mean, some, some of the players who are ruined now, they've been, uh, they've been looked after uh, parents. Also, yeah, parents taken away all the, <laughs> all the investments. Mm. Yeah, it's happened, you have stories like this. So look at your entourage. Uh, don't invest in one uh, venture. Don't put all your money on... Uh, um, one opportunity, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Eggs yeah. in one basket. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Spread your eggs. Spread your eggs. And number three, um, look after your image. Because you you belong you are in the public eye, twenty four seven now. And you no. can't hide. No, you can't hide. No matter what. You're not. You, you don't. You can't be yourself. Like be, be yourself behind closed doors, not in the public eye. No matter what you do, no matter how innocent it is, it gets turned around and yeah, and you it get gets uh, the bad. You get the bad press, and you can you can lose uh, a lot. Like Benzema, for example, right now he's not playing for national team. Um, that was one story, but you have so, so many. It's such a shame. Yeah. Such a shame that people, even at that very top level, aren't necessarily getting the guidance and support they need for things that are so critical after their, what we would be honest about, is that a short football career comes to an end. It's 10 years, yeah. uh, more or less. You know, on average, it's 10 years. You, you have to, uh, to earn um, enough for your, for your life, well, if you can. Can you think of any lesson you learned from whichever coach or manager you worked under that was relevant for you in your business career? Is there any lesson that you thought, you know, when you look back now, obviously at the time you don't think about it because it's all related to football, but did, did, did Alex or Arsenal or anybody else have, have lessons that they were teaching you that actually were applicable to your life in the future as well, even though that wasn't directly aimed at that at the time? I think uh, there's a lot of lessons, you know, they're just natural lessons. So um, they're hard workers. They come, they come to the training ground before and they, they leave after everyone. So you have to work hard, first lesson. Uh, you have to be uh, fair uh, with everyone, especially when you're looking after a team. If you want the respect from everyone, you need to treat everybody the same. And I think uh, what they were very good at is was to uh, manage the highs and the lows. You know, when you when you are under so much scrutiny and um, pressure, um, there was a lot to deal with, uh, with uh, different people, the staff, uh, the players, uh, the business staff as well. But um, they were very good at managing um, all these moments, different moments. Yeah. And you can now take those experiences yourself and say, right, if I face that in the future myself, I mean, if you build a team with either of those companies you've got, then, then quite simply, you can apply some of those lessons then. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, look, it's great having you here. I really do appreciate you taking time to come and talk about a subject. I suppose it's probably a little bit different to what you would normally discuss. You're here in Dubai now, okay? People are gonna see you out and about. Some people might get a bit still, you know, guys still get a bit starstruck because there's a, a superstar footballer out there. Mm. It, do you get the same type of connection with fans now you're a retired player? Do you still have people come and talk to you and say, hi, can I, you know, can I get your autograph? Can I get a photo with you and stuff? Do you get that or do you get people now looking at you going, I know him, but I can't remember exactly <laughs> where I know him from? <laughs> I, have, I have still the, the same connection. Um, the fact that I'm, I'm on TV for Champions League as well on, on being sport helps. Uh, for people not to scratching their heads too long, <laughs> 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 but I do have that. You know, it's you. You can see that through the generations now. The ten-year-old, uh, they don't know who I am, so they have to go. When it's mainly the parents, take a picture with with Michael. It was uh, be a big name for for Manchester United in France, um, and that's that's the way it goes. Uh, I think you can. I just appreciate every moment, even if sometimes. Um, 
I don't want to do it. I smile, I do the picture, I talk to people and, and it's annoying for my kids, they're waiting, they're pulling my hand, Daddy, let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing again? <laughs> that is part of what goes it's to the part, it's part, uh, I think it's part of, uh, it's part of the legacy. Um, and you see, you, people are happy, you know, uh, when you take the time, uh, 30 seconds, a minute to talk to them, take a, a picture, because now everybody has a, has a cell phone and uh, you can't escape uh, the selfie. Mm, you can't, indeed. <laughs> no, you can't. If you want to see some of the projects that Mikhail is working on at the moment, I'll put the links at the bottom of the screen for you to see. Go to the website, look at the lifestyle management business, uh, go to the run business as well and take a look because they're really quite interesting projects. And as much as he might have been a professional footballer playing for big football clubs and making the big money that we all kind of imagine, there's a life after football and he's had to become an entrepreneur and a business person. And for some of you out there, you are not in a very dissimilar position to him. Thinking about how you're creative, writing a business plan, coming up with the tools, maybe going back to study on the things that you need to study so that you can make sure that you can execute well on your business as well. Mikhail, thank you so, so much for joining us. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Spencer. All right, guys, whatever you do today, do what this guy did. He went out there, he hustled, he built a career, he did well for himself, and yet he's doing it all over again. He went out there and made it happen.